All right. Um, I think we'll get started now. It's uh, two o'clock. And um, if people join afterwards, I think uh, they can easily catch up. Um, welcome to the EGCN webinar on how your city can become 100% renewable. My name is Jasmine Mia from the EGCN Secretariat. We will be presenting examples from some of the leading cities of Europe and members of the European Green Capital Network. They will share their stories with you that hopefully can inspire you as well. You will have a chance to ask questions um, and see what, what might help you most become more renewable yourself. You can also share comments or links. For this, we will um, we will have also the comment function. If we could move to the next slide, please, um, where you can see the, the question uh, box where you can put in your questions and the chat function. If we don't get to all questions, I will try to address as many of them as possible. We might also be answering them in the chat. Uh, you don't just uh, you can not just ask them during the the actual presentations, but whenever you think of something, uh, please let us know and we will try to help you. All right, uh, next slide. All right, we are joined today by uh, three cities from from the network. We are joined by Johan Sandström from Umia, by Maria Rodriguez from Lisbon, and Peter Pluschke from Nuremberg as well as George Stiff from eClay, who will present additional resources on the subject. We will start now with input from the European Commission. With us is Eero Ailio. He is an advisor for energy transition and local governance at uh, DG Energy. He will introduce the European Green Capital Network and the toolkits these uh, webinars are based on, as well as some notes on European policies, such as, uh, of course, the European Green Deal. And with this, Eero, I pass the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. I hope uh, the audio is good. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be in this uh, uh, in this um, meeting here. And uh, the topic today is indeed uh, the 100% uh, the renewable toolkit, which is one in a series of, of uh, these uh, thematic seminars, and now with focus on, on, on renewable energy indeed. Well, before jumping into the uh, toolkit topic, so indeed the context of this European Green Capital Network is important and uh, it is really there to sort of bring together the winners and the runners up uh, of uh, the uh, Green Capital, Capital Award and uh, bring the, you know, the brains, the great ideas which are there, share those. And then in order to get this going beyond uh, the network, so uh, there's been, indeed uh, the idea to develop these toolkits which then take the learnings put them on paper uh, through very concrete examples and this will give, then give us a possibility to share those with other cities who are not uh, not yet at least part of the uh, uh, part of the network or or, or the awards uh, but certainly uh, we will need uh, all those in um, in the um, attempt to green the uh, green the continent so uh, i go a bit further now um, I'm going to say a couple of a couple of words about the big picture the political picture where this green capital uh, uh, work fits and of course also the renewable energy which is one one key point so on this uh, pie picture here whatever you want to call it you see the European Green Deal and this here is uh, uh, the current European Commission's growth strategy actually for the next uh, um, next five years and uh, uh, it's, it's one of the key uh, key elements of, of our sort of getting employment, uh, you know, supporting employment. But in particular, this is intended, all these measures which are listed on this are intended to sort of deliver uh, towards this uh, goal of making Europe climate neutral by 2050. So uh, that is uh, the goal. And towards this, you know, how do we get there? We need a clean energy transition and we need a tr digital transformation as well. Those are the two sort of big, big ticket items. And then uh, in the, the logic is that in all these various um, areas, policy areas, so what we want to do through the deal is to integrate sustainability and this way actually profitability in all economic activities. So that's that's the, the big big issue as well and then at the same time work in restoring ecosystems so um, uh, there we there we have the growth focus and then you have this inclusiveness 
in all of this because you can, you know, if you think of renewables, uh, uh, solar panels, for instance, so these in the first place have been very much an issue for more wealthy people who can afford to put them on their roofs. But the important thing is that everybody will have access to these and there we need smart smart solutions which are usually developed in the cities actually so that's uh, and you have to deal with things like energy poverty so um, out of this pie chart uh, i will focus on a bit on the energy uh, uh, efficiency uh, which is on the on the bottom left and then in the sort of like at 10 o'clock uh, you have the clean affordable energy so that's of course renewables on the right side, we have environmental policy issues, but we have also clean mobility. So those are the areas where I see that you cities are actually operating in. And now I'm trying to change the slide. Is it going? Let's see. Well, oh yes. So um, this here is to illustrate the logic that we've taken that the commission. You know, the one thing to change thing is, uh, to issue laws, to uh, uh, to draw up new legislation. This is really a key thing, of course, to get things changing, particularly towards the greener direction. But it's not enough. We have to get this bottom-up action involved. And that's where cities and regions are really the key players. And actually, um, the um, what we did last year was 2019, we had a clean energy package, which is new energy legislation dealing with renewable energy, energy efficiency, consumers' rights, et cetera, et cetera. And that we want to accompany with uh, initiatives such as uh, the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, which is you know, a, a big network of 10,000 cities. There are the smart cities, there are coal regions initiatives. And of course, there is the Green Capital uh, uh, Initiative as well as the Green Leaf. So all these, what we call bottom-up initiatives are really crucial because they show the lead you know they, they show that things can be done in reality and uh, and uh, the commission is more and more relying actually on this this type of activity to get uh, uh, get the change underway okay and then my last slide so now today we're talking renewables a uh, hundred percent renewable city is a really ambitious target and i can talk from a technical point of view i know that there are many things related to things like energy grids and stuff like that, which make it actually really ambitious. But we should look at it from a different perspective a little bit. It's not only about uh, renewable energy ramping up that, but it's also about reducing energy consumption. And that's where energy efficiency comes into uh, picture and uh, retrofitting and renovating of buildings, because that's where we cut the consumption and we cut a lot of waste actually. And then we bring, uh, what we want to do is to bring also new ideas through uh, uh, technologies such as smart metering and uh, demand response, which is adjusting um, demand and, and uh, um, uh, supply of energy, finding a, a uh, better match between those two. And this will actually save a lot on infrastructure. So all these kinds of issues are, are linked to the renewable energy uh, in, uh, increase of renewable energy. And here, um, the cities and actually all, all of EU got extensive rights back, back last year to generate, to store, to sell, to buy uh, uh, renewable energy. So now it's the time to really use those rights. And that's all very, very new. And that's where, again, the uh, green capital cities are, uh, are driving this, this type of activity together with cities that you find in the Covenant of the Mayors, for instance, and smart cities and others. I think you are the guys who are going to take this, make this work. And uh, the toolkit tries to put, show examples uh, on, uh, on on great things which have been done. And I know what we will have soon, Umeå and Nürnberg, and, Nürnberg uh, and, and Lisbon indeed talking, but then in the toolkit, you will see examples also from many other places like Münster, Lahti, Uslu, Reykjavik, Nijmegen, and, and, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of knowledge gone into that. And I just show the, that little uh, thing, uh, image on the left, bottom left there, this is about behavior. And why do I put it there? It's because I think that behavioral change is the key of a lot of things we are doing. And, and that's the kind of things that we bureaucrats in Brussels, we cannot handle this part. You know, we cannot influence that you know, how people 
change their everyday life. But usually the mayors and, and in the cities, you can do that. And it's the city practitioners like many of you who are actually key here because you do know what's happening in your, uh, in your environment. You know what makes people tick. And if we get this uh, behavioral change going uh, and, and moving um, like it's already happening in some of the young people like Greta Thunberg and all that movement. So then we are getting into, into great results. Um, I will stop here and I, I wish you a very, very good uh, um, discussion now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ero. Uh, that was already a great start. Um, also as a basis for the for the other presentations and we'll come back uh, to some of the things that you've said in the presentations as well as the questions um, but uh, we will start now with a presentation by Johan Sandström he is the head of sustainable development in the city of Umea the toolkit that this webinar is based on um, is itself based on a network workshop we had in Umea who hosted the network so it'll be interesting uh, to see their presentation here also for uh, for the network members again. Uh, Johan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm going to give you a short introduction to the work that we are doing in Umeå. Uh, and uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, this is the beautiful city of Umeå, uh, the Umeå River that runs through it. Um, so for you who don't know, Umeå is uh, North and Sweden's largest city, and it's been growing rapidly the last 50 years. Actually, it's, it's been double its size the last 50 years. It's a, it's a growing city. Uh, we have a young population around 38, this average age, and a lot of students. And uh, Umi is actually most famous for its birch trees. Uh, so we're actually counting every birch tree in the city center. So right now it's 2,300, it seems. So I don't know why we're so crazy about the birches, but yeah, uh, but we are famous for them, so. Uh, let's see now if it's working. Yes. Uh, this is our visions and targets when it comes to climate change mitigation. We have an overall vision that UMIS growth should be reached with social, ecological, and economic sustainability. Since we are growing, we have to take this uh, account in our, in our work every day and in the long run. Uh, and we also have, early this year, adopted new uh, climate change uh, mitigation targets, as you can see on these slides. And I think I'm just going to highlight the consumption-based targets uh, that I think is quite unique. For a city to have, uh, since we have not that much time. Otherwise, we're going to be climate neutral to 2040, and we also have a project right now looking into if we can do it even further, how we can be climate neutral to 20, 2030. Uh, but when it comes to consumption based targets, uh, we did a, a survey in uh, 2018. Uh, it was, uh, I think uh, we were. I think we was pioneering in measuring consumption-based emissions. Um, it's not that easy to do, uh, but we did a survey in, in um, to get a better picture of Umeå's footprints. Because uh, if we're only looking at the territorial um, carbon emissions, uh, you don't take account the, the emissions that the citizens in Umeå are uh, are producing other regions outside of Umeå. So I think if you're only looking at geographical boundaries, uh, the, yeah, I think it's quite misleading, actually, especially from a region like us, where we have a lot of renewable energy and uh, also quite high income, high income uh, from the citizens. Uh, but as you can see in this picture, this slide, uh, transport is uh, the use, the, the the biggest challenge for us. I think it's also the same way if you're looking at the territorial emissions that transport stands out as a, the uh, the huge challenge for us to handle. And we can also see that food stands for a lot of carbon emissions. Uh, I think the difference here also when we're looking at the consumption-based emissions compared to territorial emissions, we also include flights 
both national flights and international flights. So we don't take account when we're just looking at the territorial emissions. So. Uh, in Umeå, oh, I think it was going too fast. I don't know if I can, yeah. Uh, in Umeå, we also have a lot of renewable electricity production, mainly because of the Umeå River and we have a hydropower plant uh, that is located a couple of uh, kilometer upstreams. Uh, from the city center and it's the largest uh, hydropower plant in Sweden actually. Uh, so we are exporting around 40% of renewable electricity from the region. Uh, and we also have a lot of wind coming up uh, and also a lot of solar power has been uh, installed and growing rapidly uh, although from low numbers uh, but we see a, it's actually trending a lot here in Umeå just solar, solar panels. Uh, and around 80% of all buildings in Umeå are connected to our district heating. And it's also the share of renewables in our district heating is around 80% uh, right now. Uh, it's mainly biofuels that are the renewables. And uh, public transport, uh, since we have so much uh, green electricity here in the region, uh, we have uh, working with electric buses for over 10 years, I think. We've been testing it. Uh, and right now we have been implementing electric buses in a large scale in the city. And so we have 70% of all the, the buses in, in the public transport is electric right now. And it's not only because of the, the the climate change, it's also because of the noise levels that we can re can reduce. And we also have, during the winter time, we have problems with bad air quality in the city center. So we also get a, an effect there when we're using the electric buses. Um, and actually we have a fossil fuel public transport right now, since the other 30% are driven by biofuels. So we already have, have uh, yeah, make that change in the public transport, but we have to get the people on the buses also. That's maybe another challenge for us. And I'm also gonna give you a little insight on one of our, I think, best examples on large gauge energy efficiency actions, and that is uh, sustainable all of them. And all of them is a district in Umeå with around 7,000 inhabitants, and it's a the student area. There's a lot of students living here and also a lot of international population here. And it's mainly rented apartment and it's not Umeå's most deprived area. And after a devastating fire in 2008, I think it was one of the largest fires in Sweden that year, the whole, whole block of the district burned down. Uh, the municipality and the university and the housing uh, company decided to build up this area in a sustainable way. And we also uh, had it as a national pilot, how to do this. Uh, so we're looking at how to make this more energy efficiency and also how we can do it without raising the rent too much. Since the people that are living here are, are not the people with the highest income in Umeå, we didn't want to hide the rent too much so the people couldn't live there anymore. So that was one important target in this project. Uh, just a couple of slides about Oldham. Uh, since there are a lot of students here, the employment rates are not that high, but if you are disregarding the students, I think it's, it's over 80% uh, employment rent in this area. And uh, we also have a lot of educated people living here. So if you look at this slide, um this is there's more people here uh, that have been uh, has had a higher education and longer than three year un university degree in this area uh, compared to other areas in Umeå and also in the EU uh, so it's a good I think it's a 
it's a good area to work with since higher education also is matching the engagement and uh, knowledge about climate change. I'm trying to switch my slides. It doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, and the, yeah. let's see. And of course, energy efficiency uh, was the main target in this project. And as we can see, if, if um, since there are a lot of similar neighborhoods around Sweden and EU, uh, it's interesting to compare how the actions in Oldham uh, with national and European targets. So the, the red, uh, the red one here is all of them after the, the refurbishment. You can see that uh, uh, we, we can go a long run, a long way if if the more more areas could use the same actions. And uh, the pilot area that was built is uh, is 540 apartments. Uh, 137 was new, and those were the buildings that burned down, and 403 were refurbished, uh, the older the stock. Uh, and all, the whole area was built during 10 years, around 63 to 73. And uh, the, red, the red brick facade here is kind of like the characteristic, characteristics for the area. Uh, uh, and the energy efficiency, energy efficiency goal was to decrease the total energy use by 50%. Uh, and since I said uh, earlier, uh, we shouldn't raise the rent too much. So that was also one target. And we had one pilot building and one reference buildings that we that we was chosen. And we were analyzing all the actions that we should do in the, the whole area uh, before we, we decided what actions to take in the whole area. And uh, before we, re we were refurbishment, refurbishing all the uh, other areas. And so uh, a fantastic slide of numbers. <laughs> uh, but we had the university that was analyzing this uh, all the way, both during the, the pilot phase, where we were looking at the pilot house and the reference house, and also when the new the new buildings were built and uh, how the energy actually uh, how the result uh, was in the in the long run when the buildings were, were actually built. Uh, but if we're only looking at into the building itself and don't take account how people are using the building, uh, we reach 50% energy savings. But if you're looking at the total energy use of the buildings. Uh, we uh, got around 40% energy efficiency. And of course, domestic hot water and house electricity is, is also uh, how people are using the house and the behavior uh, of the people in the house uh, are, of course, important. Uh, Johan, I think you need to come to a close. I think this is my actually my last slide. Uh, but of course, we could have been implementing even more energy efficiency to reach uh, 50%. Uh, but then we have the problem with higher rent levels that we didn't want to uh, have. Uh, so, so they were decided that we, we shouldn't do more than this. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you one quick question because you, you said it was an incentive to, to keep the residents in, in Alitem and not raise rents uh, too much. How, yeah. how, did you, how did you manage to do that? Yeah, we actually calculated measures that was uh, too expensive. We didn't do. Okay, so it was a and of course we also analysis. when we were uh, refurbished uh, the buildings, there were also other refurbished uh, actions that didn't have energy efficiency efficiency in mind. So I think there was also one one thing that how. How much are you refurbishing your bathrooms or kitchens or yeah, what kind of materials you use and things like that? Okay, thank you. Um, if if any of the uh, listeners think of questions for Umea later on, uh, we will ask uh, questions after all presentations again. So feel free to ask them. Uh, we're now moving to the next presentation, which will be by Maria Rodriguez. She's technical director of Lisboa Innova in Lisbon. 
and she will be talking about the solar energy uh, strategy in Lisbon. Maria, uh, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present the Lisbon solar energy strategy. Uh, Lisbon is this year uh, the European Green Capital, unfortunately, with so many constraints uh, around this um, pandemic situation. I don't know if you gave me already control over the... Yep. Let's see. Yes. So just to put it in perspective, uh, the Lisbon Solar Energy Strategy, of course, goes, uh, it's within a wider uh, policy in the city for energy and climate, which has been put in place since uh, 2008 with the session to the Covenant of Mayors framework and uh, more recently to the revised Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy where within our sustainable energy and action plan we set a goal of reducing by 60 percent in 2030 uh, the emissions from co2 with a neutrality objective to 2050 in fact this is under revision under the climate action plan that we are elaborating under the the c40 global network uh, framework and so we expect to be bolder uh, and to communicate this uh, in in during this year still uh, still so um solar energy in portugal in lisbon um sorry but so, yeah actually solar energy in lisbon has not it's has been developing in a shy way to be honest and within the the framework legal frameworks that were available so by 2018 we had around 44 megawatt uh, capacity installed which accounts for around six uh, uh, gigawatt hour uh, electricity generated per year and so this is seen as a major uh, area of intervention since uh, uh, lisbon is sunny as may you know if you visit the city before and uh, with present technology we can go up to 95 percent of uh, the the consumption of the city if we wanted to use all the available areas that are uh, adequate in, the, in our rooftops so we had to put up some uh, objectives so we have uh, two two different time frame targets uh, one very shortly in 2021 where we are expecting to reach and eventually to to go uh, further 10 megawatt installed capacity which means in the very modest uh, 15 watt per capita uh, in, initially this was intended to be done uh, with a strong investment from the public side namely from the municipality uh, uh, but and also with with this pv power plant that was firstly intended to 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 feed uh the uh, the EBA's, uh public fleet uh nevertheless with the new the, with the recast of the directive of renewable energy we have been transposing that late uh, uh, late last year and uh, we have now a framework that it's very very uh very uh, flexible and attractive for uh, community uh, energy communities and, and uh, aggregation so we are looking now at this pv power plant which is municipality owned to be also feeding uh, the municipality building stock and also from from some of the uh, municipal companies that can also join this this journey with the municipality so we are looking at eventually going further to 10 megawatt uh, by 2021 to 2030 presently we have an objective and a CCAP uh, to attain a more or less 100 megawatt in the city of course this is still a little bit of the potential the city has it's something like four four percent of the potential uh, but in any case already with this regulatory transition with financial transformation with new initiatives that are coming to place still today they are being announced some initiatives for households for energy efficiency and for for renewable energy also so we are expecting to appropriate this very strongly in the city of Lisbon by uh, mobilizing the citizens and the local communities to, to go further. Um, a very uh, important tool uh, to mobilize the citizens uh, is the solar uh, the solis platform that is under revision so to make it more attractive to to the citizen also 
and uh, the main objective of this uh, of this um, of this platform is to of course promote a wide acceptance and massive adoption of pv systems it's totally focused on on solar electricity uh, the, the platform and uh, we wanted to create like this inclusive uh, feeling spirit and of solar community in lisbon uh, of course, has those objectives to support uh, the attainment of Lisbon solar targets. Also, help on the urban planning process because of the maps that I'm going to show you in a minute, and to provide for a sensible energy transition, uh, leaving no one behind in a, a just transition, of course. Um, as for the platform, we have, uh, as I tell you, we are now under revision of this platform, but in any case, we will maintain three different maps with three different geographical zooming levels. Uh, I show you here two of these uh, map, uh, two of these uh, types of maps: the solar radiation map and the solar PV system map. Uh, the systems that we know and we can uh, disclose information where they are because there are some privacy issues that uh, uh, hinders the, the whole uh, visualization of the systems uh, publicly. And uh, we have three different geographical uh, levels, as I told you, the city level, the parish or district level, as we, uh, we call it here, uh, it's more like parish, and the building level. So the citizen can uh, either look at the city, either look at its parish, either look at its building and create a sense of community belonging to this community whenever they uh, they look at comparisons, for instance, at parish level, which is something that it's important to involve and to, uh, to, to educate uh, the, the, the citizens. Engagement tools, we are talking about uh, people want, willing to belong to, to, the, to this platform and so they can give us permission and send us information about their own system. And also we have uh, a gamification with an app that will put, uh, it's kind of a digital social market where people will contribute to their parish uh, and gain points by that and also uh, solar coins, it's a digital a coin. And uh, by the end of the day, the, the winning parish will win a solar system. And so this is kind of find where the systems are in Lisbon. So at the same time, we are uh, giving people perception of what is a solar system. Because if you don't know what is a system, you don't want it. And this is something that you have to, uh, a path that you have to have in order to evolve all citizens and, and, and their willingness to have this type of, of technology. Um, information and education, of course, is another functionality that is very strong in the platform and should be, of course, that we have new regulation and now this is all the contents are under revision, but uh, uh, the questions people usually ask is how we put it. So what is a solar system even that question we can answer how can i finance how can i access to to installers and this type of of, of questions they are put in a very simple way and with a very simple approach to the answers so people can uh, feel uh, reduce their their perception of risk when adopting this type of systems um, also we have been putting in place this this movie that I'm not going to show you. It's a, a, a 3D animation, um, a film that looks at uh, Lisbon Solar Strategy and uh, the role that that citizens can have in this in this uh, in this uh, journey towards 100% uh, renewable energy in the city. Uh, you can watch it, but uh, unfortunately, we don't. We just have the Portuguese version of it. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, it has not voices, but has sentences that are uh, written in in Portuguese. Finally, just to conclude, to tell you another initiative that I don't have here in the in the slides. It's a, a kind of a, a festival, of a solar festival that we are organized. We organized two years ago, and we are intending to to continue organizing it. And it's kind of a ludic uh, activity where people in a very um, very uh, not technical way will involve themselves with several aspects of the, of the technology and the, uh, the potential for for increasing their quality of life uh, in the city so we are intending to to again have another edition of, for this 
Um, with this, I think uh, I finished. Thank you very much for all, for for your attention. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, before we move on, I want to ask you one uh, question as well. Um, Ero mentioned uh, in his presentation that with solar energy, you also have to be careful that it's not only the wealthy who can afford putting these on their roofs. Uh, do you have um, experience with combating this? What what has Liz been seen and, and done in that regard? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I have to understand that technology prices has been have been down a lot. So as I tell people nowadays, it's something like buying a fridge. It's not the same as buying a Ferrari anymore. So uh, it's more accessible to to everyone. Of course, that we have uh, uh, people that consumers that are vulnerable, and for those, we have to tackle the problem in another way. Uh, we are uh, with uh, with uh, with a public housing uh, company now trying to devise this this scheme that that we call it the uh, social solar, solar tariff. Uh, where eventually at building at building level we'll be implementing solar systems that will contribute to reduce the energy bill of all vulnerable consumers. This is underway. Uh, I cannot discuss much more of this, but uh, this is something that the new legislation allows us to do and, and give us the, the amplitude to, to now act in this direction. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Then we will move on to the next presentation, which is Peter Ploschke. He is the former deputy mayor for environment and health in the city of Nuremberg, who will be talking about their efforts to becoming 100% renewable. I'm particularly happy that he's joining us today because he's uh, newly retired, but wanted to be with us anyway and present this case. As some of you might have seen, we've had some technical difficulties, but uh, I hope you're with us now and we can at least hear you. I think so. I yes. should be with you and uh, it's my pleasure to be even without uh, showing my face. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to talk a bit about our approach. Um, is there a way to move on with a slide? Or is it? No, it's not moving. Yes, now here we are. Um, just to give the, the broad picture, Iro, he spoke about the very big picture. Of course, also on the level of the cities, there's a big picture and there are very detailed pictures to, to talk about. Generally, the city of Nuremberg and the, the whole region agreed to the international goals and try to transform, transmit these to our local conditions, which means that in the city of Nuremberg, we hope to be climate neutral in 2035. And um, we are happy that obviously for two, with the year of 2020, we should reach the 40% goal, which is set for reducing greenhouse gases. So we are more or less on the line. It is quite interesting in our case to look at the region because the city of Nuremberg, with about 540,000 inhabitants, is member of a metropolitan region, which covers most part of northern Bavaria, uh, 34 communal entities, and they all together have uh, signed a pact for climate uh, change. To show you the region, I need this little map. Yeah, and what you can see at the same time from the map is that uh, we're just in the middle between Umeå in the very north, northeast, and Lisboa in the very southwest. And uh, so we, we don't have, like both of them, a very clear picture how to achieve the 100% renewables. In the north, there's a lot of hydropower, and this is strengthening. Uh, the cities there, and in the south, there's a lot of sun. We have very little water in our region and n virtually no hydropower, and we have sun, and we're doing well with it, but it's not like uh, the European south. So we have to talk about a very broad mix of activities and of resources to gain the 100% renewables. To start with, I start with our big picture. 
Um, of course, in a big city, you need some uh, powerful supply of energy. And these two pictures allow me to tell you a bit our history. In the very center of the city, we do have a power plant. It used to be based on coal, hard coal, uh, 20, 25 years ago. In 2005, we changed the power plant into a system based on natural gas. At the same time, um, the local waste incineration unit has been installed uh, side by side to the power plant and both they serve also the local district heating system. So we bring in to the system the heat, the steam from the waste incineration, plus the electricity we can, we can win there. And what is now the task in going to 100% renewable is to um, decarbonize everything which is nat natural gas at the moment. And you can do several things. We started with uh, wood chips, uh, 20 megawatt um, power plant based on wood chips is already running. This had been installed in 2012. We are now thinking about a second unit which may uh, use waste wood. And if we talk about wood, it's clear it's forest residues and this is the region. So this is not material resource from the city and its own, but it's um, all resources from the region. And uh, we, we talk about um, in the medium term about um, large uh, solar thermal units, which may also support the district heating system. The district heating is not as large as in Umyo, but we cover roughly about 30 percent of the households and of the commercial estates. So uh, it's important um, in general. So this is um, a nucleus, which is very important. And what is secondly important is that um, the public utility, its name is written there, NRG, is uh, owned by the city of Nuremberg. So it's our instrument to work also in the region because and this is another point which may be important to discuss. They are running also the distribution grid. And uh, on the long run, to hold the distribution grid on a medium scale in your hand will be very important. At, at the moment, we have a broad debate in Germany. What does decentralization mean and we need a decentralized system if we want to become 100 percent renewable uh, because there are large plans big plans in in germany to um, extend the the high voltage systems bringing from the the offshore wind energy turbines electricity to the south and we would prefer a more cellular system which allows the regions to profit from their own capacities. So there, Peter, may, there, may I jump in real quick? Because I know how many slides you have left and that you only technically have one minute. So I, I think I need you to um, hurry up a little bit. Yeah, I stop with all the big things. I go to the, the, the smaller ones. Um, we try also to do something on energy storage, uh, which means power to X, heat, hydrogen, methane. And uh, we are happy that recently the Bavarian government decided uh, to install in Nuremberg its center for hydrogen. And so this will be another major component in a future energy supply system. Going to the smaller ones, we try to invite as many people as possible to make use of small sized CPH systems, CHP systems, uh, combined heat and power systems. This is running very well, um, and geothermal systems may be also very important. Our efforts led to, uh, there was the 50,000, 54,000, yeah, they're, they're gone. Um, this is what I want to show you. 
uh, talking about decentralization really means you're, you're going from very large scale um, in, in establishments to many, many, many small scales. So we have at the moment in our region 54,000 electricity producing units uh, connected to the grid. And this is one of the very important um, tasks to, to have a control and regulation strategy to do that. Addressing the people means for us um, to um, empower them, doing a lot on their own. I agree fully with Eero that uh, energy efficiency will be a, a second um, very important um, base for uh, the to, to, to win the race for climate protection. And uh, we do a lot in inviting them to become ambassadors. They may show themselves uh, their face in the internet, giving some remarks on what they are doing. And we, we got, meanwhile, some 200 of them who show their face and who are really working hard to convince others. We're going to schools, and schools have a little competition with an award each year um, who is, has done the, the nicest projects. Um, we go to uh, we invite science and academic institutions to participate, adult education centers. The church is very much um, engaged. And, uh, well, there's a lot of um, public um, debate on that. And we try to, to foster that and to, to go ahead to invite as many people as possible. A very special little idea is what we call the Tour, tour de Bürgermeister. The Bürgermeister is the mayors. And uh, especially because they are stakeholders who have very broad decision possibilities, but they, they are not very well informed often about uh, solutions on the municipal level. And especially with the uh, combined heat and power technology, we try to show them that especially in, in municipal buildings, swimming halls, schools, etc., they are optimal um, conditions to to use these and uh, so we went through the whole region with the 34 uh, Bürgermeisters and all their high-ranking stuff to invite them to think about changing their own supply systems and to move to renewables and to very efficient systems. Um, I think I can do yeah, I think that's, that. That's Thank you for your attention. And there may be room for a few questions. All right. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, this is our last chance to ask questions. So if anyone thinks of any, please uh, put them uh, into the question tab now. Uh, I have uh, one uh, more question that came in for Johan, for Umea. Um, you talked about the importance of biofuel. How do you uh, generate this and what biomass do you use? Is this locally grown? Um, yeah. Could you give a brief answer on that? Yeah, brief answer. Uh, residues from uh, wood industries, and yeah, so it's not we don't uh, cut down trees and burn them. It's, it's uh, residues from from the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe Maria, one more for you. So the the Solis platform. Do you have any numbers yet on on the successes on on how many people have used it on the impact you've had? Because we've also talked a little bit about bottom up perspectives. Um, and I think this is a good way to get the people involved, but obviously they also need to need to be willing to. Yeah, well, so we launched uh, the platform in, in May uh, 2019, uh, but uh, we had, uh, this was a, a finance project that had some timings that actually uh, uh, pushed us to to not take the best uh, decisions in what comes to usability of the of the platform. So this is why we are revising now the, the completely uh, deeply revising the platform. Uh, but we had in the in the first times of of being in on the air, we had um, 
a significant number of accesses, but uh, we don't have an interaction with, with people. We didn't have uh, any interaction uh, through the tools that we, we've seen. So we are not very confident on the numbers that we have if they are uh, actually very important. What I can tell is that for, for that, the, the revised platform that, as I told you, is going to be launched uh, later this year, uh, we'll have monitoring um, tools that will allow us to understand the impact and to, to improve our approaches with the community. Just to tell you that we are also foreseeing to have uh, to 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 have interaction with the communities, local communities, the parishes, with games and with uh, with activities like uh, solar tours in the city and this kind of uh, of uh, of ideas uh, that we are going to dynamize during during this uh, next year. So we'll be feeding you back with information on how successful these these strategies are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we only have one quick question uh, left, or at least time for that. Uh, there's a couple more. Um, to, to Nuremberg and Peter Pluschke, why do you think the Nuremberg metropolitan area is more ambitious than other regions in, in Germany? And is there a way to change that for the rest of Germany as well? Um, I, I, I doubt if we are very much more ambitious than others. What, what is our, our main um, approach is to do it together with a whole region, and which means that it's not just the one city going ahead, but 3.5 million people are living in that area. And we could, by our pact we had signed, invite so many companies, people, smaller public utilities, uh, to, to also to enter into this business. And um, more than half of the investment in the region into renewables has been uh, brought by private money, private money from citizens. So this was a, a major effect that we could uh, really um, invite very, many, many people to be part of the game. And this was uh, the idea behind. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I think that's where we'll have to close it. We'll try to address some of the other questions in the chat, but we're now moving on to the final presentation, which is by, done by my colleague, George Stiff. He is an officer for climate and sustainable energies at Ecole Europe, and he'll be uh, talking a little bit about further resources cities can use in their efforts to become 100% uh, renewable. Yeah, thank you, Yasmin. Uh... Yeah, so the idea of my presentation, uh, I'll just tell you from the start. Um, I'm going to be presenting first the uh, five sets of resources which you can find in the toolkit, which Euro had already mentioned uh, at the beginning. So if you haven't downloaded, look look at it. You can find out more about the three cities uh, and more that were there. Uh, I'll be talking briefly about it because you already have the links there. So you can uh, find out for yourself. So for the... Later on, I'll be talking about some specific projects that are not included in the toolkit. So please make use of the PDF once it's made available after the presentation, uh, after today's webinar uh, for the presentation. So uh, the first one is the Carbon Climate Center, which is internationally speaking, you have over a thousand cities, towns, and regions, which you can look at their targets, you can look at their actions, you can look at their performance, and you can get inspired from international perspective. Um, let's see if this works. We're moving forward. Okay. Uh, next will be the Covenant of Mayors, which I think doesn't really need uh, any introduction. I think all of you who are here probably know the Covenant of Mayors very well. But if you, if you haven't explored the website, it's got all kinds of fantastic information that you should look into from, coming from over 10,000 signatories. So you can find all kinds of actionable resources, like examples of SEOPs, SECOPs, adaptation plans, graphs uh, about their progress, the good practices. There's a lot of library materials. There are special sections on adaptation, funding, and energy poverty. So there's plenty of information for you to discover there. So definitely uh, uh, look there. It's very... 
Okay. Then the next thing I was going to point out, which is also in the toolkit, is the EU Urban Agenda Partnership for Energy Transition. Uh, some of you, many of you may know this, it's been, been led by Gdansk, London and Rosalia. They have three streams, which are mentioned on the slide. I believe that the, their main activities have finished. You can find their final action plan linked here on the slide as well. And very interesting, the commission has set up a one-stop shop which is for cities uh, working on towards energy transition. You can find information about data, funds and awards and all kinds of information. Also featured in the toolkit is Energy Cities database. Energy Cities, like ICLE, is a network of cities, but they're concentrated on energy and climate issues. So you can find a database of 100 uh, actions. So I gave an example here, uh, Lisbon is featured uh, twice in there for a sustainable campus and an e-mobility network that they're doing. But also Energy Cities has developed a lot of publications, webinars, and interviews that are also really worth looking into. So all the links are, are in the document once you're able to get it later. There's also the Renewable Energy uh, Cooperative Federation, RESCOP. And there you can find all kinds of really interesting resources and starters. This plays in also to what uh, Peter was saying for the decentralized systems that and, and uh, citizen-driven networks. This is what RESCOP is about. So you can find books, so there's Power to the People, there are all kinds of guidelines, they have an energy efficiency toolbox, they have a spin-off worked on mobility, and all kinds of other handbooks and guidance documents. So really a lot of good information to find there. So now I'm going to jump into a few things that are not featured in the toolkit, but I thought were worth uh, highlighting to you. A lot of them are uh, projects that I work on or my colleagues in ICLE, because those are the ones I know best. But there are also a few here that ICLE has nothing to do with, which are still very good. So uh, first off, talking about district heating. Uh, Keep Warm is a project that I, I work on and we've developed a learning center where you can find useful information uh, about business models and technical cases uh, and details on renewables and excess heat that you can feed into district heating systems. We uh, recently created this guidance booklet, which is uh, shown there on the screen. And that's uh, promoting how, how, how you can and why it's important for you to switch your district heating to renewables and excess heat sources. We also have a showroom of uh, pilot projects that we're looking into. Additionally, there's a few seminars that we have coming up on 8th of October and 12th of November. So if you're interested in finding out more, those will both be done in English. So you can uh, look there. A different project uh, that I don't work on called Thermos is, has a really interesting tool that you can import your own uh, building level data, similar to what uh, Lisbon was doing, it seems, with their Solus platform. And you can put it into there and calculate how to do the, your district he heating planning uh, and best. You can set, designate this this building is going to be my source and I want to include all of these buildings except for except for this one I don't want to include in my district heating network. And it will optimize it and it will tell you what makes sense. They have some really good training modules that you can follow. So then the next one is going to be on heating and cooling and I'll just highlight the go back one. Um, Moving forward too much. Okay, heating and cooling. Uh, Heat Roadmap Europe has a project which has finished already, but it has lots of uh, high level recommendations and roadmaps, but really interesting for you and cities, as you can look, type in your city, and if it's among the 14 highest heat and cooling demand countries in Europe, you will find hectare level uh, model data for your heat demand and potential supply. So here is Nuremberg, for example, where the shaded part on the left shows that there might be some sort of uh, geologic potential. And then there's also uh, little dots there for excess heat potential. Celsius is a different project we're not involved in, but they have a really excellent toolbox that's oriented towards cities. And EHP DHC Plus Knowledge Hub also has a lot of really worthwhile information. Want to highlight also for Compete for SIGCAP, a uh, project which deals with energy management systems, which is normally meant for industries, but has we've adapted the, the guidelines for local authorities. So you can really manage your, your energy very efficiently using international standards. There's also this guidebook for upgrading from a SAP to a SACAP and financing fact sheets and savings. 
other projects that are really interesting. Pentahelix works on SECAPs. Come Easy is helping to synergize those cities which are on the European Energy Award system to synergize with the Covenant of Mayor. C40 has a really good tool for adaptation and mitigation interactions. It's worth looking into. Uh, George, I'm I think you need to hurry up a little bit. Yep. Uh, just going to zoom through these basically. This is, this is something that you can look at later on, but uh, we have, I put up a few projects that are ICLE or not ICLE that uh, working on billions, energy efficiency. There's also a few which are looking at social aspects of renewables from social acceptance of wind to energy poverty and Smarties project to prosumers. Uh, there's also smart city projects, grow smarter, ruggedized, uh, sharing cities is not an ECLA project, but has a lot of really good resources available and they have a knowledge platform, which they, they say you can join. I'm not sure if it's how active it still is, but uh, you can test it out. And finally, I was going to put up one slide about mobility. All of you probably know about Civitas. So there's, that's probably the best information source that you can find but also you can find individual projects like SumSup or Green Charge and many, many other projects found in the mobility uh, sphere. That's all. All right, thank you uh, very much, George. Uh, I'm sure there was something in there for every city uh, that they can use. Um, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, as we said before, so these uh, webinars are based on, on toolkits. You can download them all on the EGCN website, including the two um, we've already published on future-proof uh, cities and uh, how you can become the next European Green Capital. Um, this is part of the EGCN webinar series. This is the first out of four webinars we'll be having in September. So uh, I encourage you to um, join one of the others if you can. Um, we will, however, also post recordings on YouTube and the EGCN website if you cannot, including this one, if you uh, want to look at some of the resources mentioned today again. So this will happen in the next days. Um, that's it uh, from our side. Um, we want to um, thank you for, for joining. Uh, one more point, uh, if you have not won the Green Capital Award yet, um, you can still apply. I think it's the end of October is the deadline. So I encourage you to do so as you will learn in our Green Capital Toolkit um, and the webinar at the end of September. It is also pretty rewarding to, to just apply um, and then to be a finalist and of course to win. But there are many uh, things you can, can learn from this process. Uh, that's that's it. I hope to see some of you again at one of the other webinars. I want to thank all of the uh, speakers and presenters for for their input today. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, yeah, goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.